thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be here with you today. Like uh, Matt said, my name is Nate, and I am just honored to be here with you. And when pastors uh, swap pulpits like this, um, did I do something wrong? I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, keep going, keep going. I don't, you can hear me, right? Okay. When pastors swap pulpits like this, um, it's, it's a little uh, iffy sometimes, but if there's no trust that's there. And Matt and I have a big trust in each other. We've been good friends. And I hold this, uh, this with open hands and with a great deal of humility. And if it's your first time or your second time here and uh, you don't like any of this, don't worry. I'm not the pastor here. And come back, please come back. And if you're a member here at ACC and, and you don't like this or you do like this, I don't care. I was invited in and I get to leave. So, uh, but praise God. We, we have the same mission in love of Jesus Christ. And we have more um, in common than we do with our differences. And the, the, the cause of Jesus Christ is is uniting. When I was chatting and dreaming with Matt back at the close of last year, he started painting a little bit of vision and then I started talking and some other pastors started talking and you've had other pastors sharing this pulpit as well and we started dreaming about what if, what if, what if. And one of the big what ifs was, hey, if Glen Burnie had some churches and some pastors that were like linking arms and, and, and working in this community together, what if? And I, because I'm an 80s kid, anybody else an 80s kid in here? All right, 80s kids unite. We're not that loud, but we're, we're the best. And uh, <laughs> because I'm an 80s kid, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the movie Tommy Boy that I'm drawn to, but it's a sitcom from the 80s, and it's the best uh, television show of all time. It's a bold statement, and it's true. And I started thinking in line of, oh, my goodness, what if we could be like these guys on this television show? Roll clip. Do we have it? Yes. Turn it up. We're going to need the full experience. Yeah. Anybody remember this show? Two people? Okay, this is going great. Best line coming up right here. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A-Team. Religious experience coming. Here we go. Oh, man. Nothing better than the A-Team. All right, you can cut video, you can cut video. Some of you, are, you're, gonna be, you're gonna be humming that tune for the rest of the week. You're welcome. I've been preaching this message uh, for like the past month and a half. I can't get the A-Team out of my head right now. It's awesome, it's great because it's motivating and it's, it's clear and it's strong. And, and the A-Team is awesome because the, the people that are on the A-Team work together. And I imagine if, if, if we pastors are, are like an A-Team, yeah, Matt can be the leader. He can be Hannibal, the guy that tears off the mustache. He can be that guy. I want to be B.A. Baracus. That's who I want to be. Anybody remember what B.A. stands for? Bad attitude. Yes. That's who I want to be. I want to be the muscle. I want to be, I want to be the guy that comes in and everybody's like, oh, no, B.A. Baracus is here. For those of you that are really into Trivial Pursuit, B.A. is also short for his name as a character on the show, Bosco Albert. Okay, nobody really cares, but I, I felt the need to share it anyway. Yesterday, we had an outreach in the community, and four, at least five churches were, were intentional about working together, and close to 400 of us came out all over Glen Burnie with 11 different projects and showed God's love in big ways. That's powerful. And yeah, praise God for that. And the power does not necessarily come from what tasks were undertaken by these projects. The power does not come from the results that we see or the things that we chalk up and we say, okay, that was worth it because of this over here, you know, because it didn't rain, you know, whatever. The power from something like that comes together because there was so much intentionality around the unity of the churches. See, Jesus had a vision for churches too. He had a vision for his disciples. He looked at his disciples and he said, specifically to a disciple named Peter, he said, on this rock, talking about the profession Peter just made that Jesus is Messiah, on this foundation, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the vision of Jesus Christ for the church of Jesus Christ. That's the vision of Jesus Christ for disciples 
who follow Jesus Christ, that we would be such a unified force that it would be built on a foundation of knowledge that Jesus is Messiah. See, we went out in the community yesterday and served, but we are not messiahs. We are not salvation. Uh, we are not the reason for salvation. We are salvation bringers. We, we are conduits, and we bring the message of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Messiah. And when churches unite, and when we are focused on our unity, when we are focused on our love, it literally pushes back the darkness in a community. That's what happens. And you look around Glen Burnie, and you're like, what, what would it be like if the darkness was pushed back in Glen Burnie? What would it be like all over northern Anne Arundel County in Brooklyn Park, in the Dirty Dina? Any Dirty Dina people here? I live in the Dirty Dina. Yeah. Yeah. Used to be. Okay. We're all happy for you. You got out. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I love my town. What would it be like if the gates of hell, if the forces of darkness were pushed back all over North County? I want you to dream about it. Because you're the church. Even those of you who aren't yet followers of Jesus, because I used to be one of these people, I would show up to places called church, and I would just take in, and I would take in, and I would ponder, and I would bring doubts and all these different things. And if that's you, I want to welcome you here. I'm so glad you're here. Keep bringing your doubts to the church. Keep bringing them to Jesus. I don't believe that Jesus is intimidated by our doubts. Actually, what happened with me is I kept bringing my doubts, and his truth started becoming more powerful and loud in my life than my doubts. That's what happens. So don't, don't be ashamed because shame you have doubts. Bring your doubts. Jesus is not intimidated by our doubts. But what would happen in North County if the gates of hell were pushed back, if the forces of darkness were pushed back? Maybe you've, you've driven past the same fire stations I've driven by, like out on B&A or on Rivera Beach, and, and we, there's these signs. And back in the 80s and 90s, these signs used to talk about how many people got seatbelt tickets, how many click it or tickets. Remember those? Now these signs say, here's how many people we've had to deal with and had to help because of opioid addiction. Here's how many people have died as a result, as a result of opioid addiction. See, I believe that when the gates of hell, when the darkness is being pushed back in a community, I think the number on those signs goes down. It's because the church is pushing back the darkness. It's because the church is out among the people bringing good news. It's because the, the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been more relevant, no matter how bad the church may get it wrong at times. See, Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. There is many, many in the harvest. The laborers are few. See, the problem has never been whether the gospel of Jesus Christ is relevant or not. The problem has always been with the workers. It's always been with the workers. Maybe you're like, Pastor Nate, I hear what you're saying. I don't feel like the A team as a part of the Church of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I feel like the D-plus team because I get it wrong time after time after time. And to you, I say, hey, I get you. I understand. The church has like a crazy history over time, the message of Jesus has remained, though, no matter how much some of us in the church have messed it up. And the Crusades, historically, that was a really bad mess up, like really bad. But the church of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ remains. I want to bring to you in this last installment of Better Together, I want to bring to you a passage of Scripture out of John chapter 15. And today, we've, we've throughout this series, we've been talking about different images, different metaphors of the church of Jesus Christ. And today I want to bring to you in this last message a picture of the vine and the branches. I grew up in North Carolina. Any North Carolina people in the house? One guy. One guy was like, okay, nobody's wooing. That, that's me. I'm sorry. Yeah. North Carolina is awesome. Y'all don't know what you're missing. But now I live in Maryland. I've been here over 10 years. Now this is home. When I was growing up in country churches in North Carolina, we had this habit where we would stand and read God's word together, and that's just like there's this like unifying thing around that, and it's just powerful to read God's word together. So I'd like for us to do that today, if that's okay. So would you stand with me? And the word of God's going to come on the screen out of John chapter 15, and we're going to read together. Ready? Go. I am the true grape vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do not bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, 
and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Amen. And praise be upon the reading of God's word. You may be seated. I want to do a little exercise with you, okay? And this is going to require you to respond to a few questions. Do you know how to respond to questions, yes or no? I asked that question to the 830 crowd, and they were like, y'all are awesome. Already my favorite service. So I want to ask some questions. This is like comprehension, okay? Okay. Jesus made some statements, and he identified some key players in this picture of the vine and branches. He starts out by saying to his disciples, I am the true grapevine. So here's my question to you. Who is the true grapevine? Jesus, yeah. Some of you are like, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, yes, yes, Jesus. I'll say Jesus, yes. Yeah, you're right, Jesus. This is not trick questions. Jesus is the true grapevine. And then he said, and my father is the gardener. So, if Jesus is the true grapevine, then who is the gardener? God the Father, yes. Two for two. You're doing great. You get down to like verse four, verse five. He starts talking about the branches. And he looks at his disciples and says, you are the branches. So, Jesus is the true grapevine. His father is the gardener. And who are the branches? The disciples, or we are. Or we are. Because Scripture invites us into this conversation over and again. And we ask this question whenever we read things in Scripture. Who is this talking to? Is this story just about the people on the page and just about those people at that time in history? Or does this also apply to me? And there are moments in Scripture where the things on the page really just apply to the people on the page. Read the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Don't go start doing some of that stuff, okay? Bad idea. And the people who are snickering are the people who have read Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Some weird crap right there. I didn't mean to just call the Bible crap. I feel bad about that. Shouldn't have said it. Please forgive me. There's grace. I'm a guest preacher. You you don't have to like me. Okay. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And anytime Jesus is saying things to his disciples, we have to read what he's saying and have to ask this question. Is he also speaking to me? And in this passage, it's very safe to to draw a parallel. When he says, I'm the true grapevine, my father is the gardener, and you are the branches. He's speaking to his disciples. Now, I want to ask you another question. And I don't want you to answer this one out loud, okay? I want, I want to let this question sit with you for a moment. I want you to ponder the answer to this question. If Jesus is the true grapevine and God the Father is the gardener and the disciples, if those of us who are followers of Jesus are the branches, who, who is the fruit? Don't answer out loud. Just sit with it for a minute. What is the fruit? Who is the fruit? See, when Jesus made these statements, he was was speaking not in a new kind of way to these ancient Jewish people. Psalm chapter 80 refers to a vine that comes out of Egypt and into the promised land. In the book of Isaiah, one of those other prophets, in Isaiah 5, the, 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 the prophet there talks about a vineyard that has started bearing wild fruit. And it's a word of judgment. So these ancient people have heard about this vine and branches image before. And Jesus is standing before them and saying, I'm the true grapevine, everybody. Could be a little problematic if you're just like tied to Judaism as is in that moment in time. But who is the fruit? 
I like fruit. I like to call pizza a fruit. <laughs> Brewster's ice cream a fruit. Fruit's great. Oh, man down. I like grapes. They're good. Anybody want a grape? Back there, really? You want, you want some? Here you go. Right there. Anybody want, you want some? Okay, okay, but you got to open your mouth, okay? All right. Oh, I didn't get it to you. I'm sorry. One more over there. Oh, uh, I just hit somebody. I'm sorry. I did this in the Baptist church. I got a look you would not believe. I love the Baptist. Who's the fruit? What's the fruit? We all like eating fruit. We all kind of enjoy it. I like these black red grapes because I think they're sweeter. And I got to purchase it from Giant last night for this illustration. And I wanted these because I wanted to eat them after and during. I used to live in Florida and there were these citrus groves. And if you pulled up on the side of the road, like acres and acres and acres and thousands and thousands and thousands of oranges, if you pulled up on the side of the road and you went to the orange grove and you picked an orange, if you stayed there for more than 30 seconds, a guy in a pickup truck, it was usually a red pickup truck, his name's Bubba. <laughs> and Bubba reminds you that ain't your fruit. See, the gardener always owns the fruit. I want you to get that. Jesus is the true grapevine. Who's the gardener? God the Father. We are the branches. And God owns the fruit that we produce, not us. So many times we like to criticize the fruit or think that the fruit doesn't fit in our five-year plan or think that we own the fruit. And wrong perspective leads to wrong living. And over the years, the church has had missteps and, and, and issues because the church has criticized the fruit and has not been happy with the fruit, but God the Father owns the fruit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, who are the fruit? What is the fruit? Now, some of you may have been to like a Bible uh, class before or a Sunday school back in the day, and you remember some things in the second part of the Bible in that New Testament called fruits of the Spirit. Anybody remember fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, those kind of things. Maybe that's the fruit. Maybe the fruit is indicative of evidence. Because, you know, you know what kind of vine it is by what kind of fruit it produces. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, they will know or you, there will be evidence to prove that you are my disciples because of your love. So maybe the fruit is tied to love in some kind of way. Whatever the fruit is, I know that we branches don't own the fruit, and I know that the fruit is always born out of the love of the cross of Jesus because Jesus Christ showed us incredible love. Now, the question here is, so what? Why, why does this matter? Why, why, does, uh, why does this metaphor on gardening matter so much in the Scripture? And it matters because of this, because if the church, if the disciples of Jesus, if we are not rooted into the Jesus vine, we will not produce the love of Jesus as our fruit. That's why this matters. Because what happens when we are not rooted in the Jesus vine is that we produce different kinds of fruit. So, in this last several minutes that I have with you, I want to give a ju juxtaposition here or a, or a um, kind of a point counterpoint. I want to talk about ways to kill a branch or how do you kill a branch and how do you grow a branch or how does a branch survive and thrive. And these things, I mean, they're shown to us in Scripture here. They're kind of simple when it comes to looking at gardening and just basic life. But they're very important because Jesus shows us very clearly in just these eight verses what happens 
when a branch dies? And what happens when a branch produces much fruit? So let's talk about how to kill a branch. Here's how you kill a branch. The first thing you do is you disconnect the branch from the vine. So here's what's going to happen. All this fruit, this fruit that I've thrown out, this fruit that you've eaten, this fruit that's falling on the floor, all of this fruit makes this branch beautiful. Now, it kind of looks like uh, the bonsai tree from Karate Kid. For you 80s kids, there you go. It's kind of like that. Here's what's going to happen to this branch. Because it's been severed from the vine and there's no fruit on it anymore, what's going to happen is when, when I'm done here, I'm going to throw it back in my nice little striped bag here, and I'll go home later. And when I'm sitting there eating grapes later this afternoon, because that's what preachers do on Sunday afternoon. They sit on the couch and they eat grapes. That's what we do. Mystery solved. When I get home, this stuff is going to go into either... My wife has this thing called a compost. I don't really understand it, but I hear it's awesome. It's going to go in there, or it's going to go in the trash. It's going to go somewhere. It's going to go in a trash bag or something. And then it's going to be broken down, and it's not going to exist in this form anymore, and it's going to be considered rubbish or garbage. That's what happens when a branch is disconnected from a vine and when there's no fruit on it. Branches that have no fruit and are not connected to a vine, eventually they look uglier than this because there's no fruit coming in. They burn up, they burn out, they shrink, they decompose. And a Christian that, that has no relationship with God, with Christ as the vine, a Christian who is not connected to the Christ vine will shrivel up, will burn up, will burn out, and will not last. And this affects the church. The second way that you kill a branch is you not only disconnect it from the vine, but you disconnect it from the other branches. You isolate that branch. If you've served in, in our armed forces, one of, one of the tactics of victory at times is to isolate the enemy, to isolate the target. A branch that has one grape on it is not as robust and beautiful as a branch with a cluster of grapes on it. I call this one, do it alone. This, this is the person that says, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. They go it alone. They do it alone. It's just me and you, Jesus. Everybody else is just crazy. While that statement may be true, the church was created as a healing agent in this world. And our power as the church is our unity and our love. Through Jesus Christ for one another, bringing this good news of Jesus Christ. And so one branch can't say to another branch, you're not needed. We've got all the fruit-bearing stuff taken care of. Just kind of hang out and, you know, we'll, we'll give you what you need. One branch can't say to another branch, we're better than you or we can do this ministry better than you. One Christian can't say to another Christian, you're not needed. One church can't say to another church, you're not needed. My church at Abundant Life out on Furnace Branch Road can't say to Arundel Christian, we don't need you. Can't tell you something, our church needs Arundel Christian so bad. Y'all do so much for the community and so much for the kingdom of God. And you love Jesus and we need your prayers. We need your support. We need to be able to send hungry people here during the week so that they can get fed. But do you know you need us? Do you know that not only do you need other churches that are similar in size and scope and philosophy, but you also need the struggling traditional church across the street that may seem irrelevant to your lives? Do you know you need those people? Do you know that even the small African-American church across town, sure, they need you, but you need them. You kill a church and you kill branches by siloing their kingdoms out and by isolating them. And the third way that you kill a, a branch is you avoid all kinds of pruning and you criticize the fruit. Avoid the pruning, criticize the fruit. It's one thing to pull out some fruit, start looking at it. See, so many of us, when 
when we start following Jesus, or even some of us now who aren't following Jesus, and we're like, I would follow Jesus, I just, I'm not there yet. Some, so many of us look at the fruit, and we're like, oh, that one's ugly, that one's too small, that one's shriveled. We don't want that fruit. Oh, it left a stain. I don't even like the color of this fruit. It gets real quiet when I start preaching this point. That one looks diseased and shriveled. We don't need it. See, when branches start criticizing and consuming their own fruit, they become cannibal branches. And remember, you don't own the fruit as a branch. God owns the fruit. And in our Western world, we, we want to avoid pain so much. We don't want the pruning from the gardener because the pruning hurts. And it's the gardener's job. And again, sorry, who is the gardener again? God the Father, yeah. It's the gardener's job to prune away the fruit, the branches. Because here's, here's, here's how vines grow, especially like back in this ancient uh, Judeo world. Back in the time of Jesus, if you wanted to plant a vineyard and you wanted to get grapes and you wanted to make wine and, you know, be popular or whatever, you would plant a seed in the ground and a vine would start growing and this vine would start growing and you, the gardener, would come along and within the first season, little buds of fruit would start coming on this vine and that's all exciting and everything, but the the grapes are literally like tiny, tiny, tiny. So the gardener would literally prune the grapes off, prune back the branches help the vine grow a certain way. Because vines, if they're left unattended, the branches will grow and they'll just grow in on on them themselves and they'll start choking out the life of the vine. So if we are the branches and God is the gardener, if we're left to grow on our own and God doesn't like direct the growth, we will grow in on ourselves and we will start choking Jesus out. In this metaphor anyway. And so... For three years, this gardener would prune and prune and prune and help it grow a certain way. And it was always growing towards the light, and it would have to grow a certain way so it could bear. And by the third year, these branches were strong enough, they could bear and they could hold nice fruit for harvest. took three years. Then after the harvest, after all the fruit was gathered, and who owns the fruit again? The gardener. And the gardener is God the Father. The branches would go and they would rest and they would be cut back for the next season of growth. It's another beautiful picture of vision, vision realized, new vision, vision realized. Some of us have been in a pruning season for a long time and in our Western world, we just want to avoid pain. But here's the promise of God. He redeems pain. He brings purpose to pain. And sometimes it's not just the pruning of the gardener that causes us some uncomfortableness. Sometimes storms come in life and just like wreak havoc on everything. And we feel the storms in life. And some of you, you've been in a storm season for a long time. You're like, where's the flipping relief, God? I was supposed to follow you and this stuff was to feel lighter. I don't feel the relief. I don't see the fruit. And the problem is, in that moment, I've grown such little tiny fruit I'm expecting a huge, big harvest, and sometimes I just want, like, the big harvest quicker than I want to be able to bear a specific type of fruit or a large enough fruit. And in these ancient days, in these, in these, in these worlds, they would cut it back, and it would grow, and it would release. And so many of us in the church of Jesus Christ We want to dictate what the fruit should be rather than measuring our obedience and our abiding in the vine. Yes, as a Christian and as a church of Jesus Christ, we should be pushing out fruit. But our measure of success is our obedience to the vine, period. Pastors have fallen into this weird world where we dictate the fruit at times and we think as Oscar Miru from Kenya says that the fruit of the church is around three things bucks money buildings and butts the three b's bucks buildings and butts how many people you're running how much money you got and how pretty is your space 
Can I tell you something? Those things are important, but it is not the fruit of discipleship. Those things are byproducts. Those things come alongside, and they're important. But it, those things should never trump our obedience or our abiding in the vine. Because we can become capitalist, capitalist business people in the church of Jesus Christ and squeeze Jesus out of everything we're doing if we're not careful. So that's how you kill a branch. That's how you kill a church. How do you make branches thrive? Well, the first thing is you remain in the vine. A Christian that has a robust, intimate prayer life is a Christian, is a disciple that can weather any storm. Back to when I lived in Florida, there's like a, a week and a half of winter in Florida most of the time, <laughs> most years. And there's like a, a night where it gets like 35 degrees. On, those, on that, like one or two nights a year, at least when I lived there, the, 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 the fruit growers would go out and cover up the, the fruit. And they wanted it to get cold and they wanted to work because the saying went, the colder the winter or the more severe the storm, the sweeter the fruit. And if we remain in the vine, if we remain in our prayer life, if we have a robust connection to Jesus, we can weather any storm. And he's bringing us through that storm. And it's not just for our own self-preservation. It's because eventually there's going to be fruit that comes out of that season that we're going to give away freely. Because it's never been about me. It's never been about my consumption of the fruit. It's always been for the kingdom of God. And the second, second thing is all about connecting to each other. Now, you know that unless we're connected to Jesus as the vine, we are not going to be connected to each other. <laughs> we got too much going wrong between us that unless Jesus is at the center of it, we won't reconcile. Because here's what this looks like. Before I was connected to the Jesus vine, I would criticize everything. I would just see something, a piece of art, or I would see something that somebody did, or I would, I would just be all judgy. I would see it, and I would see just a little imperfection. I'd be like, yeah, that right there, they got that wrong. Should have done this. If I were doing it, I would you know. But now that I've been connected to the Jesus vine, what I find myself doing is being more grateful and more thankful for what's going on in my life, the diversity in my life, the stories I'm learning from people who are not like me. Before I was connected to the Jesus vine, there were people that I struggled to forgive, and I would see them in public, like at Target, and I would see them, and I would do this number. As soon as I saw them, I'm like, yeah. Again, it gets kind of quiet when I start talking about Target and seeing uncomfortable people. I don't want to, you know. Because it's real, and, and unforgiveness is real, and I don't want to be around that person, so fight or flight, I'm going to do the honorable thing and not even engage them. But when I'm connected to the Jesus vine, what happens is I'm attracted to the person that I have a conflict with. Not like attracted, like, hey, let's go on a date. No, not like that, but attracted in that I want to go and resolve the issue, and I want to, I want to bring the love of Jesus with me. No longer do I want to avoid that person. I, I want us to build a kinship so that, yeah, we may disagree on something, but we have Jesus in common. And that is stronger than our uncomfortable feelings here. Before I was connected to the Jesus vine, I would drive on the beltway and yell at other people in my car. You know, the person in the left lane going 43 mile an hour, you've done it. You've done it. Some of you are like, oh, preacher, you're just, you're just pushing my buttons. You've done it. Now that I've been following Jesus, now that I've been connected to the Jesus vine, what it looks like is I, I am starting to find truth in Scripture that I, have to, I don't have to be anxious about anything. I, I can cast my cares before the Lord, and it's not just some kind of weird, like, I'm going to avoid it, and I'm not going to name it or any of that kind of stuff. Now that I'm connected to the Jesus vine, I see that person, and I humanize that person. Instead of yelling at that person, I start praying for that person, because what if that person just came from, like, Johns Hopkins with a bad diagnosis? What if, what if that person is going through something? And I guarantee you that person is going through something. You know why? Because we all go through something. I start humanizing that person. And seeing them as Jesus sees them. And the fruit of abiding in this Jesus vine is that I humanize other people. And when we are connected, when disciples get together and they are connected, and they are connected by the Jesus vine, they're connected to each other, they produce much fruit. 
And they produce much more fruit than they could if they were just on their own. And let me tell you something again, church, and again, I don't expect amens on this, but it's true. When we start thinking about our spirituality and our discipleship as the fruit that God's pushing out of our lives that we can give away, all of a sudden we start thinking about things that Jesus thought about more. Because when we're not connected to the vine and when we're not connected to each other, we start treating religion as a consumable. Did I get fed today? Some of you that got grapes, you were fed. Did I get fed? Did I like the music? The AC was one degree cooler than I wish it would have been. I didn't like the guy's beard. We tend to make things about our consumption rather than about our pushing the fruit out and giving it away. I can tell you something, church. You will be fed more when you give the fruit away than when you just consume it all. That is not your design to just consume a religious experience. It's always been to have a life that is pushing the fruit out and giving it away. That leads me to the the very last thing, and I want to invite this awesome worship team. Aren't they great? They're wonderful. I want to invite them back out because we're going to sing some songs after I say amen here. And the last point here, how, how does a church thrive? How do disciples thrive? How do we, as the branches, grow? Remember how to kill a branch, you you reject it all pruning and you criticize the fruit. It's the opposite to grow. It's embrace the pruning and give away the fruit. Some of you, you feel like you've been in an extended season of pruning. You feel as though God may have forgotten you. You feel as though there's been too many storms. You wonder, does he even like me? Does he consider me? Is he even real? All these different things. And I came all, from all the way across town today <laughs> to tell you that he loves you, to tell you that he cares about you, and he loves you because he, you are his child and he sees you as his child. But he also loves you because there's a greater purpose in your life than just feeling good. There's a greater purpose in the life of this church than just accomplishing some things on a five or a ten year plan. There's some greater things as Christians than just finding the church I like or the preacher that tickles my fancy, or the music that I am gravitating towards the most. There is much more about this church thing than what we can consume. It has always been about being known for our love. Always. Some of us were like, but God, the pruning, why does the pruning keep happening? Why does the pain still happen? Well, there's several answers to that. One, you're still connected to the vine and you're still in a world where storms happen. And in order to grow, there has to be pruning. And so pain is a part of life. Jesus never said he would take away the pain. He promised that he would be with us and he would give us purpose through the pain. And some of us are like, but God, it just, I'm fatigued. I can't take it anymore. And I hear you. I would lovingly just encourage you with this. You're not yet the version of a branch that God has destined for you. Stay connected to that Jesus vine. Don't separate from it. Don't leave the church. Don't leave faith in order to find it somewhere else. You're going to find yourself dried up on a heap somewhere. But Jesus wants to push this life through you and build into you this version of you that complements his church rather than consumes it and pushes the fruit out into the community. Why? Because he loves you, but he, he loves all of humanity. And you are, you are a redeeming agent. That's what you are. He wants you to be whole and healthy, and he wants you to produce much fruit. The, the biggest promises of Jesus in this passage, in verse number 7, is that if you remain in me and I remain in you, you can ask for anything you want and it will be granted. That's a big promise. But it also follows one of the sternest warnings. And I found that true when there's a promise in Scripture. It usually follows a warning. If you read verse 6 again, those who do not remain 
will be cast out and they will be burned up. I encourage you to remain. Stick it out. For those of you that are not yet followers of Jesus, I encourage you, get connected to this Jesus fine. It'll change your life. Would you stand with me? I want to say a prayer over you. And over at my church where I'm the pastor, one of the things I ask our church to do is to put their hands out like this, palms facing upward, and it's a posture of receiving. And if that is not your deal, no worry. Just bow your head, close your eyes. Nobody's going to like sing where you are or anything. It's fine. But for those of you that want to receive a blessing like this, uh, this, is, this is just an, an act of unity and, and faith. So God, I pray for my friends here at Arundel Christian. I pray for your healing church to sustain and to push out the fruit of love. Not so that it can be consumed in the four walls or consumed in the same body, but that we may share it. And as churches united, we may push back the darkness in a community. God, would you keep us close to your heart? Because as branches, we are nothing more than image bearers of Jesus. Every single one of you, you're an image bearer of Jesus. Now take his image and take his love and recklessly push out that fruit and share it in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.